Good morning, everyone. It's great to welcome you today. I am Saul Jimenez Sandoval. I am the Provost at Fresno State. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar called Gandhi and the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. In this webinar, we will explore Gandhi and his legacy, especially as it pertains to how he furthered the ancient Indian principle of ahisma or nonviolence in the U.S. civil rights movements. Here to start the webinar, it is my true honor to welcome Dr. Joseph I. Castro, our president of Fresno State and the sponsor of this webinar. President Castro, please. Thank you, Provost Jimenez Sandoval, and good morning and welcome to our three esteemed speakers today. We'll be introduced shortly, and to Professor Vina Howard, who played a pivotal role in organizing today's event. I'm also grateful to all the guests here today. After hearing from hundreds of people from around the world, from India, Pakistan, and around the United States, in addition to those based here in California's Central Valley, it is evident to me that many people worldwide want to learn more about Gandhi. As the national conversation on issues of race, violence, and inequality continues, Fresno State plays a critical role in examining history and the individuals who made lasting contributions to a just and fair society. Gandhi and the other individuals represented in our campus Peace Garden are honored for embodying the spirit of peaceful and constructive activism for their intellectual and values-driven growth, not absolute purity, that ultimately led to inspired leadership and progress in the pursuit of equality, social change, and justice. The Fresno State Peace Garden was established 30 years ago as a student-led initiative in support of peace and nonviolent activism. And I thank Professor Kapoor for his vision and leadership at that time and his continued support. The statues erected in the garden over the years are tributes to a diverse group of individuals who dedicated their lives in the pursuit of equality, social change, and justice through peaceful methods. The garden reminds us all that change is possible and that the fabric of society is greatly strengthened when individuals have the courage to stand up for a just cause. All four individuals recognized in the Fresno State Peace Garden, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, and Jane Addams embodied the spirit of peaceful and constructive activism. This transcendent quality is what the garden memorializes. It does not necessarily honor every facet of their lives. We applaud those who call for a clear-eyed look at history and the individuals who shaped it. We also urge everyone to consider carefully the overall significance of each individual's lasting contribution to a just and fair society. On that basis, we believe that those we honor in the Fresno State Peace Garden occupy an important place in history and should continue to guide us in promoting courage, social justice, and tireless efforts to make a world, make the world a better place. The current local discussion about the Gandhi statue is an opportunity for the university and our communities to come together to explore his legacy from historical and scholarly perspectives. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd now like to ask Provost Jimenez Sandoval to proceed with this very important event. Thank you. Thank you, President Castro, uh, for this beautiful introduction of the meaning of our Fresno State Peace Garden. And now, here to introduce our webinar and our distinguished panelist is Dr. Vina Howard. Dr. Howard, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, President Castro and Provost Jimenez Sandoval. And thanks to all of you who are joining us from local areas and other parts of the countries and the world. Last October, we hosted Gandhi's Global Legacy International Conference at Fresno State. Many of you were here um, to celebrate that. 
In this academic conference, scholars and activist leaders critically analyze Gandhi's methods of nonviolent direct action and his philosophies, and they discuss their relevance for our current times. Today, this webinar will focus on the history of connections between Mohandas Gandhi and leaders of civil rights movement, as well as the continuing struggle against racial inequality and injustice. Against the backdrop of current critical conversations on issues of race, violence, and oppression, this event will highlight many of the lessons that can be learned from the historic connection between India's independence struggle and the U.S. civil rights mo movement to fight racial inequality and injustices. In 1959, Martin Luther King Jr. articulated this connection. I'd like to share with you that quote. I quote, Gandhi was probably the first person in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. Love for Gandhi was a potent instrument for social and collective transformation. It was in this Gandhian emphasis on love and nonviolence that I discovered the method for social reform. Now I will give you uh, the format of today's webinar. I'll briefly introduce each of the three panelists. Their complete bios are on the website. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Each presenter will have 10 minutes. We would like to leave enough time for Q&A. I know this is not you know, ample time, but I'm sure we'll have uh, time for audience members' questions. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A section of the Zoom screen, not in the chat box. Presenters, please unmute yourself before speaking. Our first presenter is the Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. described him as the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. Inspired by Mohandas Gandhi's nonviolent methods in India in the 1950s, Reverend Lawson led revolutionary sit-in workshops in Nashville, Tennessee to fight against the practice of racial segregation and the oppression of African-Americans. Both Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Congressman John Lewis considered him a great teacher and their mentor. You might have heard his powerful speech at the funeral of John Lewis. If you have not, I highly recommend it is on YouTube. Reverend Lawson, it's always a great honor to have you at Fresno State. Our second presenter is Dr. Vinay Lal, who is a cultural critic, writer, blogger, and professor of history and Asian American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. His intellectual and research interests include South Asian history, comparative colonial histories, the Indian diaspora, the global histories of nonviolence, and the thought of Gandhi. He has authored and edited 17 books, including the two volume Oxford Anthology of the Modern Indian City. Welcome, Dr. Lal. Our third panelist is Ms. Diane Dillon Ridgely, who has a 45 year career as an environmental and social activist. She has served on many national and international boards. Originally from Dallas, she has advised and served on over 23 US delegations at the UN and international forums spanning the tenure of three US presidents. She has witnessed many struggles in the United States. She has a rich history of personal connections with civil rights leaders and prominent South African leaders. I asked Ms. Diane recently, how old were you when you learned about Gandhi? And she responded, well, there was never a time I did not know Gandhi. So welcome, Diane um, Dylan Ridgely. And now I invite Reverend James Lawson to the microphone. I'm grateful for the privilege of being here at Fresno State for this webinar. Again, I want to express my appreciation um, 
for all who've planned it. The Peace Garden, which I saw several years ago for the first time, uh, needs to be seen as a wonderful uh, piece of the curriculum of Fresno State uh, in uh, lifting up the statues, you have a place for walking and a place for thinking. And I would like to urge students of the campus uh, to walk in that garden daily or every other day, to use it as a place of meditation and to use it as a place also of shaping who you are and the gift of life that is in you and the people in the Peace Garden and others and let let the Peace Garden be a tool helping you to shape your own vocation and calling and your own young adulthood as you proceed in life itself. We do this in a time when the United States has experienced perhaps the largest and finest nonviolent movement in our USA history. Over 700 cities have had these demonstrations for the discussion of how in a democracy police should operate. A discussion that the nation has never had. And also a discussion about why we as a people in the USA have continued to allow police to be executioner of our citizens without question when we insist we're a nation of law. I want to lift up the fact that in the midst of this massive nonviolent campaign, there are elements of violence. The culture itself is a violent culture and the police represent that. But then there are the um, Antifa people and the anarchist groups, both organized groups in many places around the country that think that little bits and pieces of violence, sabotage, fighting the police is important to social change. They are absolutely wrong. They are more a part of a world culture of violence than they are a part of any movement for the emancipation of life from the shackles of hurt and brokenness. Then there are the looters, and I'm going to say something very harsh. The folk who want to call Mahatma Gandhi a racist are really to be class classified in the category of the looters. Uh, uh, criminal elements coming to the foreground, using the cover of a movement <laughs> to put their point of view on uh, display. They are terribly wrong. They are the enemies of all movements in the United States for social justice, political justice, for gender justice, for cultural justice, and for uh, ending our culture of violence. I recall in 1947 when I first read the Gandhi autobiography, I found in that book no traces of racism. The book was already a book against casteism and racism, against the, against the crippling of any segment of humanity. I also discovered in 47 then that any number of black leaders had gone to India for various meetings and made a deliberate effort to meet and see and talk with Gandhi about Gandhi's work in South Africa and in India and how that work influenced and affected their thinking of how to end the rapaciousness of our society that was trying to become a totally segregated society, a totally unjust and unfair place. Uh, I read, for example, about um, Dr. Benjamin Mays, president of Morehouse College, Dr. Modakaya Johnson, president of Howard University, 
I read about Bishop Eddie Carroll, a United Methodist Bishop who went with Dr. Howard Thurman to visit with Gandhi in 1935. Uh, in the United States itself, there were people like Dr. Charles Lawrence, uh, a host of others, the Nelson brothers who were friends of mine in Ohio were massively influenced by the Gandhian perspective of love, nonviolence, and tactics of social change that did not have to use hate or fear at, at all. These men are all men who knew racism in the United States at its core. And yet they saw in Gandhi a pioneering figure in the world who gave them hope and directions for changing this country of the United States of America. The other thing I want to say about this is that I read in the 40, late 40s about the African National Congress, its organization in South Africa. Albert Luthuli, later people like um, Bishop Tutu, all of whom sought to organize their movement out of an apartheid society and out of colonies into their own national development and use the nonviolent philosophy and tactics as their major form of, of pushing for this change. I would say very boldly that Gandhi was a pioneer against every social, political, economic, violent spectrum that was hurting people anywhere in the world. He was a pioneer against caste and racism. And to try to mark him in something different from that is a crime against humanity in my own judgment. Uh, through the nonviolent methods that I learned from Gandhi, and uh, I was able to move south at the invitation of Dr. King, and then to teach massive numbers of people all across the south how to use <laughs> love, nonviolence, truth, uh, not only to bear the slings and arrows of racism, but then to resist it and end it. The nonviolent paradigm is a call to Western civilization and especially to my country, the United States, to move from violence as a power for social political domination and change to nonviolence. Both Dr. King and Mahatma Gandhi insisted that the world must go in the path of nonviolence, soul force, if we of the human race are not to destroy ourselves. Martin Luther King put it this way, coexistence, co-annihilation. The role of Gandhian theory and methodology was a massive blessing to the United States. And if we can urge our further understanding and preparation, um, using what is going on primarily in the nonviolent campaign today, we will make the change that our nation needs. Um, through nonviolence, the human race can not simply survive, but live. This is the contribution that Mohandas K. Gandhi has made and will continue to make. Good. I'm finished. Thank you, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawson, for your wise words. Dr. Vinalal, please. Uh, thank you. Um, 
uh, I would also like to begin by uh, extending my gratitude to uh, Professor jo uh, President Joseph Castro uh, of uh, uh, California State University of Fresno for uh, inviting me uh, to uh, present today. And I would like to, of course, extend my thanks as well to uh, the Office of the Provost and uh, the staff uh, and uh, Professor Vina Howard for facilitating and organizing uh, really and thinking through the whole program. Uh, now, uh, it's always difficult to follow uh, Reverend Lawson for all kinds of reasons that should be obvious by the remarks that he has already made. Uh, but I have to say that he has wonderfully laid the ground for some of my remarks. Um, I am going to uh, take a few minutes to, uh, in the first instance, uh, uh, offer a very brief historical perspective. Uh, and then towards a conclusion, I would like to um, address a, an aphorism, if I may put it this way, that appears on many statues uh, of Gandhi, um, including the one I believe at uh, Fresno in the Peace Garden, uh, where Gandhi is uh, attributed as saying quite correctly that my life is my message. I'd like to try to understand what that might possibly mean. Um, so let me first begin by saying that, you know, we, uh, and Reverend Lawson has spoken about this quite often. Um, I've heard him mention this many times, that he has some reservations, rightfully so, with, with the phrase civil rights movement, because he has often insisted that we should think about the nonviolent uh, movement. Um, I would also like to uh, suggest that we can think about something called the long civil rights movement. Uh, in other words, when we think of the civil rights movement, let's just assume that we can use the phrase that we're really thinking about something that originated roughly with the Montgomery bus boycott and then lingered on as it were after for some little bit time for after the assassination of Martin Luther King. But we're really speaking about, let's say the period from 1956 to, you know, let's say the late sixties, which was the most intense period. But I want to suggest that particularly when we're looking at it in relationship to Gandhi, we have to really think about the 1920s, early 1920s. And so when I speak of the long civil rights movement, I'm really thinking of the period from 1920s through the 1960s, which in my judgment is the richest period in American history with respect to the contribution of African American intellectuals, activists, musicians, writers the vast number of whom all had an engagement with Gandhi in one way or the other. Let me give you one brief illustration of that and then I'll go back to my point. So we've all heard of the great poet coming out of the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes, right? Now Langston Hughes was someone who in his younger days and until the 30s was deeply committed uh, to uh, communism. Uh, and in fact, he, he paid a visit to the Soviet Union. Um, and he, in 1932, called Goodbye Christ, which I'm gonna read out very briefly, and then we'll see what happens 10 years later, which is really quite remarkable. So he says, Goodbye, Christ, Jesus, Lord, God, Jehovah, beat it on away from here now. Make way for a new guy with no religion at all. A real guy named Marx, communist, Lenin, peasant, Stalin, work, worker, me. I said me. Go ahead on now. You're getting in the way of things, Lord. And please take the Saint Gandhi with you when you go. Right? So, so we see from this point that Langston Hughes had no time for Gandhi at this point, and when he writes his poem, Good, Goodbye Christ, in 1932. Um, now, in 1943, right, so 11 years have intervened in between, and of course, those 11 years represented a sea change in the world in many ways. World War II had come there. Uh, one of the things that Langston Hughes was not aware of in 1932, but he was certainly aware of that in 1943, was the atrocities that had been committed uh, in the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin. All of this had come to light. But, but what was very clear was that, that it was apparent to everyone that, that violence, the crushing burden of violence, was something that 
humankind had to deal with. So in 1943, he writes a poem called Gandhi is Fasting. And he says, mighty Britain, tremble. Let your empire standard sway. Let it break entirely. My Gandhi fast today. And he doesn't just say Gandhi fast today. He says, my Gandhi. It's a manner in which he's almost taken possession of Gandhi, that this is my man for the day now, right? You may think it foolish that there's no truth in what I say, that all of Asia is watching as Gandhi fast today. I mean, it's what George Orwell wrote after the assassination of Gandhi when he said that, you know, look, I mean, I have some reservations about this person, but it's quite extraordinary. This man would go on a fast and the whole world would come to a standstill, right? I mean, how, how did he achieve this miracle time after time. Right? And, and the poem goes on. So now we can see what an extraordinary change in one of the leading writers of the United States, someone who has come to a very different understanding of Gandhi. And I think that when we study Gandhi intensely, I would submit that this kind of thinking about Gandhi, our thinking really begins to evolve we begin to un have a deeper appreciation of what he's about. But let me go back very briefly. I had, I had said that this long civil rights movement, as I'm de describing it, really begins in the early 1920s in some fashion, when W.B. Du Bois, um, who edits a journal uh, published from, by the NAACP called The Crisis, and he's really the founding editor, he really made the journal his own uh, uh, for, for a couple of decades. Uh, in 1922, he writes the first of 18 long articles on Mohandas Gandhi, all right? The first of 18 long articles. And the last one is 1959, just shortly before his death in Ghana. Um, so he had a lifelong engagement. And once again, we're talking about someone who, who was really a non-believer. He's an atheist, he's a communist, but yeah, and he knows the kind of profound religiosity that Gandhi embodies, but this doesn't come in the way. I mean, there's a very interesting conversation that Gandhi has with an atheist, um, and the book is called An Atheist with Gandhi, which describes a manner in which Gandhi said that, well, you know, when you, when you think about satya, truth, it encompasses everyone. And that is why he always, he moved from the formulation, God is truth, to truth is God. This is a significant shift in Gandhi's understanding of how one attempts to encompass everyone through the idea of ahimsa. And if we go through it, which of course we, I, we cannot do, over, do that over here, we see that through the, four, through the 1930s, 1940s, the African-American press had an extraordinary engagement with Gandhi and the Indian independence movement. I mean, there are over 2,000 articles published in the New York Amsterdam News, the Atlanta Daily World, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Messenger, the Crisis, several other newspapers, which are predominantly black newspapers uh, and, and run, run by black people. And largely the constituency was African-Americans, you know. And then this journey takes us through the 30s as, as Reverend Lawson has pointed out. Um, we have black theologians. He men mentioned Benjamin Mays. The, one of the more extraordinary visits, of course, is the visit of Howard Thurman uh, to uh, India in 1936, where he meets with Gandhi. Uh, and, he, and, and, you know, they, they have an extraordinary conversation. Um, at the end of which Gandhi says that I dare say that the next great phase in this history of nonviolent resistance will be among your people. I mean, those are practically the words that he uses in 1936. And this long civil rights movement would include people like obviously Paul Robeson, uh, who, who in a sense understood that one had to think about South-South exchanges, the global south, the solidarity of people, colored people, the solidarity of oppressed people around the world. Uh, and then, of course, people like Pauli Murray and the activists, including uh, Reverend Lawson himself, uh, who become a major force in the boom and which I need not talk about. Let me, however, in my concluding remarks here, very briefly move on to this um, aphorism if we may call it that, 
my life is my message. Hmm. Now, what did Gandhi really mean by that and how might that be interpreted? Um, I'm going to be very brief here because I think one could do a book on this very saying of his. But I want to suggest only three things by way of a conclusion in interpreting this remark, which you find on the statue, uh, I believe, of Gandhi at the Peace Garden and also um, uh, statues of Gandhi elsewhere, many statues of Gandhi elsewhere. And the first is that Gandhi did say that, you know, I want my writings to be buried with me. Um, thankfully, we didn't take that very seriously. All right. But what he did mean by that, in addition, is that I want to be judged by what I did. Okay, I want to be judged by what I did. Now, so we have to look at the relationship, and, and I'm not setting up that old dichotomy here between the vita contemplativa and the vita activa, that is the life of contemplation and the life of action. This is not a plain, straightforward dichotomy between thinking and acting. Um, there are instances in which uh, thinking is the highest form of action, can be so, right? But I think it is imperative to understand one thing about Gandhi, and this is, this is what, it, it, it's quite important because it can be misleading for many people if they don't understand how to interpret it. See, Gandhi was always aware of the constituencies that he was addressing. Now he's, when he returns to India from South Africa, he understands as he moves around India, no one traveled as extensively as Gandhi did in India. He went to the remotest villages. He understood that these, he was dealing with people who were largely illiterate, but it, simply because they were illiterate didn't mean that they were devoid of wisdom, of course, but they were largely illiterate. He understood that there were certain practices which had been available and which were oppressive, so to speak, for a very long period of time. So his pronouncements are often conservative, but you have to see what he does. So for example, he'll say that, well, you know, there is a gender division of labor. Women should work largely at home and men should work in the public sphere. And so if you read what he says there, you think to yourself, oh, well, he's another sexist here. Not at all. Because, if, because what we see is that if you look at the ashrams where he lived, all labor was divided, not according to gender at all. Women worked in the kitchen and outside as the men did. And so what we see here is, a, is something very different. With most politicians, a vast majority, they'll say things that are very, quote, progressive, right? But their actions really point to something that is quite conventional. With Gandhi, it's the other way around, all right? And finally, let me end with an anecdote about this idea of my life is my message. Because what Gandhi, of course, is also suggesting is that do not instrumentalize human beings. Do not ask something of someone that you do not ask first of yourself. Mm -hmm. Do not use others, right? All right. And this is the anecdote that, you know, people would be lined up every day to see him, to receive his darshan, as it were, to, uh, to talk to him, to get his opinion. So there's this old woman who's standing there with her grandson in line to see him one day. And she's been standing under the hot sun for a long time. And finally, her turn comes and she appears before Gandhi uh, and says, Mahatma Ji, I have a problem. And he says, what can I do for you? And she says, well, you know, this little grandson of mine next to me, he's five years old and he's constantly eating sweets and his teeth are going to rot. And he's, I'm worried about him getting diabetes, but he won't listen to me. He listened to you perhaps because you are the Mahatma, right? Um, and so Gandhi simply says to her, come back a month later. That's all he says to her. Now she's really puzzled, but she, but the Mahatma has spoken. The Oracle has spoken, right? So she comes back a month later and she's in line. And then finally she sees Gandhi once again with the little son and she reminds him 
And he says, oh, yes, yes, you know, with this toothless smile, he says, yes, yes. And then he tells the boy, well, you know, you shouldn't eat sweets and all of that because it's bad for your teeth and you can, you know, get diabetes and your teeth will rot. And the old woman says to Gandhi, but you could have said everything you said now a month ago. He says, yes, but the problem is I was eating too many sweets myself. So for the last one month, I've had to give up sweets. And now I have the authority to tell her. And your grandson, the same thing that I could have said, but then I didn't have the moral authority to do that. Right? This is in part what he means when he says, my life is my message. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Lal. Um, uh, Ms. Diane Dillon. Okay. Um, I too want to add my um, um, uh, great thanks to um, President Castro, uh, to the provost, especially to Dr. Howard. She um, clearly cares so much uh, and has curated this entire program uh, with such a thoughtful way. And I am truly honored uh, to be on a program with both Dr. Lal and with Reverend Lawson. It is very daunting. And I thought, uh, and I, I've been impressed with how many people have contacted me. I know Dr. Miriam Renault, a good friend, is uh, watching us from Avignon tonight. I've heard from people literally from Japan, from all over the world. And, and obviously an hour is just nowhere near enough time to cover what we're, we're doing. So we have to think of this as, as a moosh boosh, as a, as a bit of an appetizer. I hope it's opening the doors uh, for uh, particularly the students. And you will see that there is so much more that is so rich that we could spend hours and hours and in fact courses on this. And I encourage uh, Fresno State to figure out ways in which we can follow up and do more on this. Uh, in talking with Dr. Howard, we thought that what I could perhaps best contribute is, is the personal side of this. Uh, born in the 1950s, I'm a fifth generation Texan, and um, I literally uh, was born at, at a time as, as this period of nonviolence, and as some people call it the civil rights movement, was literally opening up. And I happened to be born into a family that was intimately involved in this. As some of you may know, um, Dr. C.T. Vivian, Courtney Tyndall Vivian, uh, passed away um, on the same day uh, earlier as John Lewis did last month. Well, I first met C.T. when I was five years old. He and my mother were, were the dearest of friends for, or for 50 years until she passed away. And he became a godfather for me. And I'm going to try to in, 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 in my 10 minutes to touch on uh, a component of C.T. Vivian and what he taught me personally about how the lessons of nonviolence and, and the, the word that I'm going to focus on is the word of love, a connection that I had personally with him over years of being an example. Uh, for Desmond Tutu, I also happen to be a multi-generational Anglican and uh, the longest conversation I ever had with Bishop Tutu was focused on this triangularity that there is between um, the, particularly the Blacks of South Africa, the um, African Americans in the United States. All of this has expanded, but I'm talking about in, at the time we were talking. And the role of Gandhi from his time in South Africa, which was the catalyst for much of his activism, because prior to that time, he had been very much of his own designation, an empire man. And he had, and I always sort of refer to it, not unlike St. Paul, he had his epiphany out of being uh, challenged on a train and not being allowed to go into the first class cabins after that. And it pricked something in his head that I've been reading all this, but currently these words and these dictums don't apply to me. I thought I was above all of this. But with only 10 minutes, it's really just a sampling. It's really hard. <laughs> I also want to touch on, and I hope people who uh, may not know much about her, Wangari Mathai, who was one of my dearest friends. I gave one of the eulogies for her. We were friends for the last 17 years of her life. She 
was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. We were there in Norway for the Peace Prize ceremony. And there was this moment uh, in 2004, and it was exactly 40 years after Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize. And the uh, program, they have, it's multiple days of commemoration and celebration. But on the day when all of the school children from Norway do the programming, we closed the booklets, we turned them over, we stood, and we all stood and we sang, we shall overcome. And there was just for me this, my personal epiphany moment of realizing that in a very real sense, this Negro spiritual, this simple, pure song had become the global anthem of addressing issues around um, uh, liberation and, and equality. And I was, I had to think of the words of Theodore Parker. Uh, Martin Luther King used them very often, but they originally were the um, New England abolitionist cleric, Theodore Parker, who passed in 1850, who said, um, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't, my eyes see but a short way. But basically he was saying, my soul knows that there is an arc of humanity and all I can see and all I know and trust is that it bends towards justice. And as I said to Dr. Howard, when we were uh, discussing this uh, uh, program and what we would talk about, I said, I recalled the very first media interview I did uh, in this century for 2000, I was asked, what would be the word that you would think of for this century? And I said, well, I, the, the word to me is the word of justice. This is the century of justice. And in a very real sense, all of this action that has been going on, and while Dr. Lawson said, Reverend Lawson said it and Dr. Lau said it, I'm gonna go an even step further, that not just this time period, but I'd like to think of this country that the United States uh, certainly did not start out anywhere near egalitarian or inclusive, but as Thurgood Marshall often said, the, you know, when he would go through the Constitution and then the Bill of Rights and the rest of the amendments, he said, we've got a pretty good start. And we should really think of, we have the impatience of our individual lives that we live, but if we can step back and be students and, and children of history realize that the arc of this country is in of itself an arc that is towards this bending of justice. And Gandhi, as Dr. Lau was just mentioning, traveling in India and the route from South Africa back home to India and the recognition that for whatever reason, brown people all around the world seem to be subjects of empire and colonialism and I, I will put in the piece that I often use as a reference point, the doctrine of discovery. I hope when we mention these pieces along the way that as students, um, you will take note of these and you will go back with the uh, Pope Alexander and um, uh, Nicholas V, if I remember correctly, uh, from the uh, papacy, they secured that this um, papal doctrine was secured and was the justification for the explorers, the Henry and the Navigators, Columbus, et cetera, for them to take the spoils that they found as they went around the world and send them back to empire in Europe. Uh, and we are very much still working our way out of this struggle. And I, I encourage all the students to also look at uh, the, the, the impressive and important work of 1619, which was curated by uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, in the past year, looking at the 400th anniversary of when African Americans came to the shores of the United States. She and I both, I'm, I'm old enough to be a mother, literally, but we both were uh, prompted to, to investigate this by a book by Lerone Bennett Jr. called Before the Mayflower. And we, we have distortions of history, but we also have components that are, are, are being, I said this past year in particular, we're at this racial reckoning moment. To me, it's like we've ripped off the, 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 the bandage and, and the scars and, and the transparency of truth and sunlight is, is allowing 
for all of the distortions and the lies to, to be cleansed and to be exposed. Uh, the other person that I want to mention is I'm also very fortunate to have been able to have Benjamin Mays in my life. He and an uncle of mine were classmates uh, and fraternity brothers. And they were Omegas for people who know what that means, Omega Sapphire. Um, and, and he would come, he had this circuit that he would preach in addition to being the president at Morehouse. And in Boston, um, my um, John B. Garrett's um, uh, wife, Virginia, used to cook for them when he would come to preach in Boston and she had gotten a little old for this. I was a young wife and, and a mother at the time uh, in, uh, in Boston. And one year when he came, I got to fix a meal for him and the importance of food, uh, we could go off on that. Uh, but, but to sit around the dinner table and have, uh, and just to absorb, you know, the stories and, and people that I had read about all my life and have them sitting, and you know, I'm sitting in the same room with them. So I mentioned being born in the 50s and growing up in this time of the civil rights movement. I wanna honor my time so we have some time for questions. And we just this past week and a half ago, I had the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, and it was chosen to be on the 28th because that was the day 65 years ago that Emmett Till was murdered. I, um, and then also in that week, we had the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And, you know, you hear these dates and times. Well, that was a 75-year process of getting to the 19th Amendment for women's suffrage in the country. But let's be clear. If you look at people like Fannie Lou Hamer and Ida B. Wells and, and African-American women in particular, there was no real uh, infra. Uh, franchise that occurred for them at that time, it wasn't until 1964 and LBJ and the Voting Rights Act and the, the things that we learned and came up again so much when we looked at uh, John Lewis's uh, legacy. But the point I want to make is five weeks after the March on Washington, there was the Birmingham bombing where four girls were killed um, on a Sunday morning when they were in Sunday school. One of those girls was named Carol Robertson she was in a national organization called Jack and Jill. I was in the same organization. We were the same age. If she had not been killed that day, she would be my age. And I felt my life, part of my life must be dedicated to that bending that arc, to being focused on civil rights, to live out the, the quest for equality and justice that she was denied the access to, to live out because she was martyred. We have so many of those who have become veterans in this struggle. They didn't sign up to be veterans, but by virtue of lynchings and killings, they became veterans in this long legacy. Um, there is so much that is pregnant in this moment of reckoning, so much that is in Black Lives Matter. And it's important to know that we also have the legacy that is compounded by what has happened with Native Americans in this country, with Latinos, with uh, people who've come from uh, China and other places in Asia. And we've made this statement that we are going to be this, this big tent, this open country. Um, but we have, by many of our actions along the way, been anything else but. And so there's an intentionality and so let me quickly go back to C.T. Vivian. Uh, if you've never seen the um, television series, Eyes on the Prize, I hope you will look at it. I want to remind you as students, you are you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. That's the age that I was. I went to Howard University. That's the age that I was you know, going through all of, 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 of these experiences. We were living them. You are living in this history now. And we need to have a consciousness, a patience, but also a thoroughness. We need to be very, very careful that we don't quickly take a teeny little piece of information and then assume a much, much longer piece. Um, I, I remember vividly uh, one long conversation with, with CT, everybody in the world called him CT, with CT where he explained to me why we had to have, the movement had to be nonviolent. 
and, and you should learn about the Highlander Institute where you literally practiced and you learned and you studied. It is not necessarily easy to be nonviolent. We as animals, and we are, when you are confronted, your, your instinct is to push back. It takes strength and, and, and courage to respond with love. Jesus calls for that as well. In fact, if you look at the base of the world's religions, and I'm not going to try and be a theologian, I'm not. But if we look at, and this is also what uh, Bishop Tutu said to me, you know, and, and we've become very familiar with John Lewis's famously saying, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. Bishop Tutu told me that for the reconciliation process in South Africa, after, you know, Mandela became president, and apartheid was ended, he said, we had to go in and find love. The forgiveness, it, it may be beneficial to those forgiven, but it's fundamentally for the forgiver because you, you are in your way of being able to move and go forward. And we as human beings must go forward for subsequent generations. Now the time is short. Thank you so I, much. I, this one. Can I just? The, it's a. It's only a paragraph. My one Gandhi quote that I wanted to read that concludes this: When I despair, I remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time they can seem invincible, but in the end, they always fail. Think of it, always. And that's my favorite Gandhi quote. Thank you again so much. Thank you so much, our presenters. Um, we have 272 participants, and we have a great number of questions. Uh, the questions range from the Black Lives Matter um, movement and the uh, nonviolent uh, methods, discipline, uh, practice of discipline, training as Reverend Lawson has done, some academic questions about dichotomy of violence, nonviolence. But I want to start with a question. Uh, Gandhi always said that I want to speak to my critics first. And he always said that the dissent of opinion must not mean hostility. So I'd like to read a um, couple of questions and I'm, I have combined, there were several, um, so that, um, either Evan Lawson or Dr. Lal, because they have a, you know, research and experience in this area can answer. The one of the question is, please address the issue of racism that Gandhi allegedly had in South Africa, and also the accusation of Gandhi and pedophilia. And then there's another student who is a high school student said, um, and these questions are combined. Um, I'm a student from the MLK Freedom Center how can we view these leaders such as Gandhi with an unbiased perspective and focus on the lessons they taught us as well as help others to do as well? So these two are combined. The student is sort of kind of trying to answer. So I'd like to give time to um, Reverend Lawson and we don't have to end the webinar right at 11. And I think that people can still ask questions because there are some very wonderful questions. Reverend Lawson or Dr. Law? Please unmute yourself. Yeah, I was going to say, Reverend Lawson, why don't you go ahead first and then I'll follow. Oh, no, you go ahead. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah. So, so let, let, let me just briefly address both the questions of uh, uh, Gandhi's purported racism, um, particularly in South Africa, and the question of pedophilia, uh, which is really a you know, the second one is really the oddest way of putting it, but I'm aware of the question, of course, because others have posed it too. So that reference, let me begin with the second one, that reference is to a particular, uh, uh, you, you know, what, what are, to use the English word, an experiment uh, that was uh, carried out by Gandhi towards the end of his life. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is an experiment he carries out uh, with his grand nieces uh, and his personal physician, not at the same time, uh, uh, all three of them, of course, uh, but uh, um, it, 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 the, the word experiment here is not, uh, uh, doesn't render the 
the, the word that Gandhi would use and the Sanskrit word, which is yajna, that is a sacrifice uh, that he's undertaking. It's a, it's a, a very complicated scenario, which I can't uh, go through here. I've written about it at enormous length, but let me put it to you this way. So what, for those of you who are not familiar, perhaps with this particular accusation, what it refers to is uh, Gandhi going to bed naked with, uh, with the, uh, these young uh, women um, um, including Abba and Manu, um, and Dr. Sushila Nair, who was his personal physician. Uh, there has uh, never been any insinuation by anyone, including his harshest critics at that time, uh, that this, this involved anything like what we would call sexual intercourse or sexual intimacy. Uh, the best way to really to answer this in a word, because I, as I said, I've written enormously on, on, on this and there are so many complicated aspects to it. But the best way to answer it is that I would like to remind everyone that Manu, uh, who was uh, one of the women um, who took part in it, and all of these women uh, did so with, to use the modern word, their consent, uh, of course, people have asked, well, what would it mean if the Mahatma asked, I mean, would it be possible to decline their consent? So I'm aware of that criticism as well, but, but it was done with their consent. But the easiest way to take care of it is to remember that Manu wrote a book subsequent to these experiments, which is called Bapu, My Mother. Now let's ponder over that. Bapu is of course a term of endearment for Gandhi. And the word literally means father. So it's father, my mother, if you wanted to translate it into English. See, Manu, when she goes into bed, she says, I, you know, I go into bed with him and within one minute I'm snoring away. Right? And and to her, Gandhi was like a mother. You know, Gandhi would oil her hair, comb it, and at the same time, he's having discussions with all the political leaders about the future of Indian independence, all right? So we, we cannot interpret this. I mean, this whole idea that he was, a, you know, a pedophile, that he was sexually exploiting young children, this is a complete fabrication of what is represented by this. And of course, he understood that he was taking a risk so to speak, uh, but this is public. This is not something that is, is, is you know, hidden away in the corners here or there, all right? So that's addressing this subject very, very briefly. On the question of racism, so uh, this refers to remarks that he made in South Africa. There are two components to this question, frankly. Uh, and the first component is certain remarks and observations that he makes about black people um, uh, in, in South Africa uh, uh, over a period of time. So over a period of, let's say about 15 to 20 years. Uh, and secondly, the other component of that is a question as to why Gandhi did not include black people in his struggle in South Africa. Okay, those are, those are the two components to this question. Let me take the second component address it very briefly and then move to the first one. The second one is that the first thing I would ask people to reflect upon is that Gandhi, it is very clear, never undertook, if I may put it this way, a struggle on behalf of someone or a group or a community unless he was asked to do so. Let us not forget the politics of representation. What I mean by that is this, let's supposing that Gandhi had actually included black people in the struggle. I can assure you that today the critique would have been how dare he did so, how dare he spoke for a black person. Okay? That's the critique that would have been present today, that people speak for the, themselves, which is not something fundamental. I agree with. I think that, that you know, we can't simply say that only black people can speak about black struggles and only white people can speak about their struggles or, or Asians speak about their struggles. No. But the important thing is, number one, that, that there is nothing, no evidence on record that he was ever asked by any black community or organization or people to say, well, we want you to agitate for our rights as well. Now, 
we have to understand that in South Africa, the Indian community itself was highly fractured. It was an enormous struggle just to get all the Indians on board. These Indians included indentured laborers. Uh, th these in included people like Gandhi himself who came from a different community in, in South Africa. These are called passenger Indians as opposed to the coolie Indians. It included people who spoke many different languages. They were Gujaratis, they were Tamilians, there were people who spoke other South Indian languages, right? It was an enormous struggle just to get all the Indians on board. I haven't, of course, even given you the conventional explanations that are usually put into place here, namely that Gandhi's views evolved, because we find that the word kafir, so this goes to the first point now here, the word kafir, which he uses, and I think we have to understand the historical circumstances under which he used that word. Because I can assure you, you look up the Oxford English Dictionary and you look up the historical record of how this word has been used. That it is that at that point in time, it did not have, generally speaking, the pejorative connotations it would begin to acquire later on. In fact, it referred to a whole, a several different classes of people. All right. The other thing is that if you track Gandhi's use uh, of this word, you find that 1913, he ceases to use it. Okay, he ceases to use it altogether. And, and we can do a very detailed analysis to understand how is it that Gandhi's views on the question of race began to evolve. In some ways, he is following the conven conventional views. In some ways, he is actually setting the trend for changing our thinking on the question of race, right? That is, I think, actually very fundamental because we find that, that Gandhi, I would argue, quite to the contrary of what has been argued when people say that he may have been racist, that in fact, the, the way in which our thinking on race has evolved owes largely to Gandhi. And we have to look at the role that he plays, which is a role that W.E.B. Du Bois recognizes in the crisis when he started to write on Gandhi. So that, that's briefly my response. You know. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lal. Um, Reverend Lawson, do, would you like to make a comment or should you move to a different question? Yes, I want to say to a great extent that I agree with um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lal. Uh, in the way in which he analyzes this um, and uh, points to the history of Gandhi very clearly. Um, I, I want to come back, however, to my theme. Uh, I have um, been engaged with all sorts of fringe people and groups across eight decades <laughs> beginning in my high school years. And I have uh, often in those early years stood toe to toe with them with anger, rejecting their fringe position on religion, on anti-Semitism, on racism, on violence and nonviolence. In almost every struggle in which I've been engaged across this nation, there have always been those outsiders who want to use the campaign for whatever their own purposes are, do not want to join the focused struggle which Gandhi had in South Africa and India all his life. Uh, I, I come back to the point that those, what some scholars are calling the radical fringe do not have a solid argument for the position that Gandhi was a racist. They are wanting to deprive the movement and the major struggle against racism and economic deprivation and sexism and violence. They want to cause that movement to fracture and disappear. They should not be taken seriously. Uh, period. Uh, 
they have not neither the human experience or the intellectual um, yeah. posture or historical understanding to represent anything except a kind of I maintain criminal element in the street and uh, by no means should be take should they be taken seriously um, a period I've met them in Los Angeles, in Memphis, in Nashville, in Oakland, in Olympia, in Washington, D.C., in Boston, in Orlando, Florida, where I've, uh, in, in my work across the decades, uh, I maintain that they seek to do damage, to stop the movement towards the movements, towards equality, liberty, and justice for all in my country and i resent those positions that i would call a radical fringe position that has no merit in the meantime the movement for a different united states of america through nonviolent struggle through nonviolent theory and tactics must become the mainstream. And no doubt many people cannot join that. But every movement of power is a minority movement. Uh, but the discipline of a nonviolent work is the thing our activism in the United States needs more than anything else. And um, so um, I'm going to stick to the fact <laughs> and I have floating through my mind many of the arguments I've had with that fringe group of people in Los Angeles since 1974. Every, every struggle we have had in Los Angeles, we've had fringe groups that have pretensions that are not connected to anything except their own spiritual condition and inability uh, to be in the struggle for truth and justice. Uh, Reverend so, Lawson, that those are very profound words that you give us. Uh, would you end this webinar with uh, thoughts on the following? Gandhi dealt with the challenge of, um, of, of, of this, how does nonviolent movement today remain nonviolent when all of the bad actors, such as vigilantes walk the streets and people in power might seek to foment violence mm -hmm. and make sure that the truth of their nonviolence is reported in this time of misinformation or distortion of truth? This is one of the questions that came through as well uh, through the webinar. So how is, it that, how is it that you can teach us nowadays uh, to promote this nonviolent movement in a time when there are, are powerful forces that are acting um, mm -hmm. upon the country and upon the movement as well? That, that is, I think, perhaps the most important practical question. Um, and I do not Arasa, know. Please unmute yourself, please. Beg pardon? Yes. We can hear you. Okay. okay. I consider your question um, the most important practical issue. Uh, I do not know many of the details in the present struggle in the United States, but I'm assuming that the Black Lives Matter network. Uh, before every demonstration and in their own meetings where I've been with some of the leadership in Los Angeles, keep emphasizing the nonviolent character of their demonstrations. That they repudiate the radical fringe groups as well as the police in their violence but they call the marchers to keep the discipline of nonviolent work, both inside and outside. 
both in their gestures and their walking and in their own hearts. That, that has been the model of many struggles, the Birmingham campaign, the St. Augustine campaign, the Memphis sanitation strike, the Nashville movement. In Nashville, I was able to do this through what I called the Central Committee. So John Lewis, for an example, and C.T. Vivian had actually uh, more than a two-year experience of demonstrations and actions with different targets, plus the fact we were always sitting down late at night, early in the morning, analyzing what we were doing and analyzing it from a perspective of Gandhian nonviolence or Jesus nonviolence. So uh, uh, CT and John and I and others like us have had, had the advantage of in Nashville doing this constant reinforcement of the theoretical uh, look at what we were doing from a nonviolent perspective, as well as then in the streets, <laughs> engaging in a great variety of actions to desegregate downtown Nashville, which was a very long process. So I'm assuming that in case of the Black Lives Network, they are doing that daily work or weekly work uh, with the demonstration itself. Remember, a part of the model that I use, the metaphor that I think of is that a great, a good, strong um, athletic team like a football team, a, a part of the coach's role is always to remind the football team of the st strategy for the game and of playing hard with knowledge and character. Uh, so the athletic metaphor is a far better one for us in the nonviolent world than the soldier or warrior metaphor. Thank you very much. Can, can I Lawson. say one thing very quickly? Of course. I just want to say something about um, the, the night I met Patrice Coulours, who's one of the three founders of the Black Lives Movement. I, um, you know, was, I don't want to say skeptical, I was meeting her and, and taking it in. She came to this discussion with such a grounding in love. Part of what we've been all talking about is how do we make love a, a public policy uh, characterization? You know, you have people like Hazel Henderson who talked about the love economy. You, you have Gloria Steinem who at the end of the day says the whole feminist movement is about how do we figure out how we have love distributed. Patrice spoke um, you know, about being attacked. She was traveling with a, 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 a guard to keep her safe. And yet everything in her message was such a message of love. This was two or three years ago. And I think, uh, you know, I go back to the quote that I used, the, the tyrants and the murderers and those who will give false witness and testimony in the media may seem to work, to be winning or invincible for a while but as gandhi said they always fail always and we must hold true as um reverend lawson has said as dr Vala said as ct always said to me as i got to read martin luther king's papers it is a focus on love my favorite alice walker book is anything we love can be saved we can save this country we can save ourselves, we can our save our souls, but we must do it through nonviolence and we must do it through love. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with a focus on love, I'd like to sincerely thank our distinguished panelists who have given us much to think about today. As we heard the struggle for justice and peace continues, Fresno State is a leader in facilitating the conversations to assess our history and to build precisely on that. We honor leaders like Gandhi, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Cesar Chavez, Jane Addams, and our own Reverend Lawson, so we can all learn aspects of their lives to improve on them, to address our contemporary challenges. My deep appreciation to Dr. Vina Howard for having spent countless hours organizing this informational webinar. 
And finally, my admiration and appreciation to uh, President Castro for having sponsored this webinar and for upholding the ideals of what Fresno State represents. What are these ideals? Our university is a space of dialogue where we respectfully explore ideas and build bridges of knowledge that allow us to better relate to each other to forge a stronger community. I want to thank everyone for participating and please be on the lookout for the second webinar on Gandhi tentatively uh, titled, Gandhi's vision of India, the question of partition and the quest for unity and harmony. Thank you everyone again and have a great day.